Hi, Ross. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm a columnist with the New York Times, and I'm here with... I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm a columnist for the Daily Beast and also for Tablet Magazine. And uh, we originally arranged this blogging head to talk about a totally unfraught, non-controversial, pretty boring subject, um, abortion. But we're actually talking on the Monday morning after the shooting in Arizona, so we figured we should talk about something equally uncontroversial at first instead. Um, right. And so, and since I imagine, I mean, you know, you and I disagree about almost everything. Um, but the one thing that I guess we did, that I do agree with you on that I was, you know, grateful that you mentioned was that I, I do agree that we live in a political culture where nobody was wishing for this to happen. That it's not the equivalent of the assassination of the governor of Punjab in Pakistan. Um, nevertheless, you know where your column made me want to bash my own head into a wall. You, pretty, was, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. I mean, well, you know, it's just my own head. I'm not bashing anyone else. That's true. Um, was this? And I, you know, and I think that we have agreed. We have disagreed for a very long time about the salience of the extreme right and of kind of right-wing conspiratorial rhetoric in American politics. Um, what I found so infuriating in the last 48 hours is that, you know, many people, not just liberals, people who study, you know, right-wing, or people who study political violence, not just right-wing political violence. Um, you know, someone I talk to a lot is Brian Levin, who runs the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism. Um, at, at UC California, um, Bernardi at California, at the University of California, at Bernardino, you know, and he's someone who studies violent jihadism. He studies eco-terrorism, and he studies, you know, kind of the patriot movement, the militia movement. You know, and he's been saying for a long time, we, this is how this happens. You know, you have a certain amount of kind of rhetoric ramping up. You have increasingly heated intimations of, you know, kind of imminent totalitarian takeover, you know, with the Clinton years, it was black helicopters. It was also FEMA concentration camps. I mean, that was some language that you heard a lot from the militia groups that then kind of migrated onto the edges of the GOP. There was small acts of domestic terrorism, but ramping up very, um, you know, kind of ramping up in a way that, that was visible to people who were watching it. Then you had Oklahoma City bombing. And when people mentioned, when people then said, you know, We've been pointing out that this is where this sort of thing leads. Every people on the right say, how dare you politicize this tragedy? Um, and there seems to be something really similar happening here. Although the links between Lautner and kind of conspiratorial right-wing rhetoric are much more tenuous. But well, right. I mean, and I, we should, I should stipulate, uh, just, just for viewers, since I don't know when blogging gets will air this, that we're talking Monday morning. By the time you see this, we may know much more about um, the shooter than we do right now. We may have discovered, you know, the collected works of Glenn Beck or somebody completely different on his bookshelf or something. But I don't but think you need that. I, I guess that's where I disagree is that I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to, to find that. And I don't think that you are ever going to find a one-to-one -one, um, one -one correlation. Right. I think it's pretty, I mean, if you, you did you see his, his, his videos such as they were? I, I did, channel? yes. I've, the, the, the government, yeah. So they were mostly incoherent, and I think that the he, he was clearly, or I'm not a psychiatrist, he seemed to be a schizophrenic um, or, or unhinged in some kind of similar ways. Right. But the, the moments of, of lucidity were parroting kind of extreme right-wing rhetoric that has been injected into the mainstream via people like Glenn Beck. And I guess what I'm... Well, what, what, were, those, what were those moments, I mean... I actually do kind of worry about the wisdom of having an argument since we actually will probably know more about him soon. But it didn't, I mean, it, the connection between the sort of moments of lucidity and things that Glenn Beck or Ron Paul have said about, you know, the Fed or fiat money or whatever seem, I mean, he, you know, he mentioned, he mentioned currency and so on. But like, you know, we have videos of him burning a flag, I believe, and... Well, that's not... A, and, and that actually, that kind of extreme anti-government, I mean, that's that in itself is not super uncommon 
in the Patriot Movement. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that he was a member of the political right. I'm saying that the structure of his conspiracy theories, in as much as they were lucid, correlate pretty directly with the kind of right-wing demimond that, that Glenn Beck and others have mainstreamed. I mean, you know, the idea that you can't accept any money that's not backed by, by gold or silver, this obsession with um, unconstitutional laws and read the Constitution and, you know, we're not, we have a federal system, we're not required to accept unconstitutional laws. Even, weirdly enough, and this is something that I think um, I've just learned about, is that his his obsession with, with English grammar, which struck me at first as just being um, an expression of kind of pure dissociative um, fantasy. There actually is a kind of far-right militia figure who has a similar obsession with English grammar that the Southern Poverty Law Center has pointed out. Um, yes, so again, it's like the, government, the government is controlling us through our grammar. But, I mean... Okay, so last year, a guy went into the Discovery Channel headquarters mm -hmm. um, in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, mm -hmm. area has been around to go to movies fairly often, um, with a bomb strapped to his chest, and um, basically went in, it, it seems like he was, he was ultimately shot dead by police um, before anybody was hurt, but he went in with, as far as I could tell, a sort of stew of extremely fringe environmentalist, mm -hmm. you know, anti-population growth views, and he was going after the Discovery Channel because he felt like their shows about John and Kate plus eight and the Duggars and so on were glamorizing breeders and glamorizing, you know, all these parasitical human infants and so on. Um, now, I mean, I guess, you know, that's, that, that's that? so, so you have a psychopath of some sort last year with connections to some kind of demimond that has some kind of tenuous connections to the American political left. And I don't understand I, why the why I don't think these are fruitful conversations. I guess here's, here's I, I think if you can here, establish okay. a direct connection between some sort of, you know, some sort of actual political incitement and actual political violence, then I think it's fruitful to have a conversation about me, incitement. Me, okay, so let me say, um, let me ask you a question. I mean, I think that to me the big difference between obviously my argument is not that all kind of acts of, of violence and madness or even all political terrorism is right-wing political terrorism but in the case of the discover in the case of the discovery um, hostage taker do you see any similar um, kind of structure of rhetoric on the left in which people were in which main relatively mainstream figures including political candidates were constantly talking about the need for violent insurrection to deal with the problem of overpopulation. We're constantly talking about the need for Second Amendment remedies to deal with the problems of overpopulation. Had, had targeted the Discovery Channel specifically many times before. I mean, I think it's important to note that Gabriel Giffords herself had been targeted, that she herself made a statement about, you know, where this sort of targeting can lead. That the sheriff, um, who's now investigating it, clearly sees some link between the kind of climate of incitement in his area and this kind of act. I mean, to me, the important thing is that, and the reason that it's worth talking about is because this is not unique. There's been a whole series of kind of very small scale, but nonetheless occasionally deadly um, acts of, of right-wing violence in the last couple of years. You know, there was Richard um, Kapowski, who shot, there's been, you know, Norm, uh, him and, and others, there's been a couple of cases where people have shot police officers because they were convinced that Obama was about to take away their guns. Um, there have been, there was someone who was arrested in a shootout in California. He was on his way to go murder somebody from the Tides Foundation. The Tides Foundation is one of, you know, Glenn Beck's, you know, kind of bet noirs. He's constantly going off about, you know, this being part of the, you know, part of the kind of conjuries of, of groups that are plotting um, the New World Order and plotting to kind of destroy the American system as we know it. There have been, um, so any, you know, and then there well, have been, and then there have been a huge ramping up of threats against um, sitting congressmen, almost all of them Democratic sitting congressmen. And you, and you saw something similar in the early 90s where there was, a whole, there was, a, you know, kind of a sudden burst of right-wing violence that was 
ramping up in the in the in the years and months before Oklahoma City. And some of those people were crazy. I mean, John Salvi, who was kind of on the fringes of the Patriot movement, and then killed two people in a Brookline, Massachusetts abortion clinic, was probably schizophrenic. Um, there was someone who shot up the White House after listening to a lot of kind of Patriot talk radio, but he also believed that you know aliens were controlling um, the administration. Right. So I, I just, to me, this is it's what what is significant is two things. One, that this doesn't ha happen in a vacuum. This was predictable and predicted, and the reason it's worth talking about our. A, because, you know, I don't think anybody is saying that the political climate needs to be, you know, kind of completely decorous or that even really, what I do think is that, is it really too much to ask that there be maybe a moratorium on political figures um, winking at rhetoric about violent insurrection against the government of the United States? How many and, political figures have been winking at violent rhetoric, at rhetoric about violent insurrection? I mean, you have you have Sharon Angle mentioning Second Amendment rhetoric, Second Amendment remedies. You have, um, and you have, you know, you have um, a guy making a comment that you know the Jefferson quote about the Tree of Liberty and so on. No, and, and then there was there was a candidate in um, there was a candidate in, there was a, not a candidate a winning um, I, I'm for, actually forgetting his name. There was there was a congressman in Texas who was talking about you know. If the ballot box doesn't work, there was um, Alan West, who was just elected to Congress, his spokesperson, who gave a speech at a Tea Party rally, saying the same thing: if, it, if if we can't rely on the ballot box, it's time to turn to the bullet box. I don't really know what a bullet box is. There is, and again, I I, I hate to keep harping on Glenn Beck, and I'm not sure how much you watch Glenn Beck or listen to his radio show, and I only do it, you know, occasionally because otherwise. I would. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, f I'm pretty familiar with the, with the Glenn with the Glenn Beck Glenn style. Beck's and what Glenn Beck is fond of doing is it's this sort of FEMA concentration camp thing. Where first he'll say, you know, he, he likes he likes to. Um, I mean, he, he plays what I think can be kind of a dangerous game, where he will sort of float something and then back off from it and say, well, I can't confirm this, and then right. he'll say, I mean, with, with the with the FEMA thing, he said, you know, I can't confirm this, and then he said, well, we're not going to do this story because, you know, I, I couldn't I couldn't confirm it, but by floating it, he's lended legitimacy to to fringe ideas. It's true. But And he also is constantly saying, you know, you, they're coming for you, you need to be ready. Um, you know, we'll say something like, if any of my viewers out there are, are ex-special forces, you need to prepare, this can happen here. Um, you know, on his radio, for example, he was saying, you know, that the government was going to come and seize his children because they, because he wouldn't give them flu vaccinations, and, and if they did, it would be, you know, meet Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson. Um, this, you know, he, there was right. nobody like this in the Clinton years. There was people, or there was nobody with his kind of reach in the Clinton years. And that kind of rhetoric, which, you know, when I've ever, seems to pervade um, the Tea Party and get some currency around the fringes of the Republican Party, it's just, I, I don't see how you can say that it's kind of completely unrelated to that moments when the rhetoric well, it, ramps up um, tends to also be moments when there's a lot of political violence. I think you could see something quite similar about the rhetoric of violent revolution on the left in the late 60s and early 70s. Well, let's take the case of Timothy McVeigh, right? Mm -hmm. So Timothy McVeigh blew up a building in Oklahoma City mm -hmm. after a period um, in the early Clinton years when there was sort of a wave of black helicopter-ish stuff that did get into the fringes of the Republican Party. The main reason that Timothy McVeigh blew up that building was in response to a sort of militia movement narrative of persecution that focused on events in Ruby Ridge and Waco, Texas, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, fundamentally, this was the, pr if you're looking for a sort of primary proximate cause for McVeigh's terrorist violence, it was cases of what, were, what, what he perceived um, as sort of um, you know, crazy federal overreach, basically, right? I mean, that's sort of the big story about Timothy McVeigh, that this was sort of a period of militia narrative, you know, basically sort of um, sort of narratives of persecution driven by what were perceived as actual episodes although there's of persecution. Actually, although there, and there's actually a kind of a, a chicken and egg dynamic there, because these earlier 
episodes of, confr of confrontation were driven by people who were kind of themselves in the grips of apocalyptic anti-government narratives, you know, that led to these kind of federal standoffs. Right. I mean, I, I don't know. We don't have to dig, get too deep into the case of Waco, but I think, I mean, I, I agree that the, you know, the people on the correct, yeah, and, and Ruby, Ruby Ridge is probably a better, a better example of that, but, um, so, so you have, so you have that case of McVeigh, and then you have a sort of period of, um, you know, a period in which this, um, this act of terrorism is pretty deftly exploited by Bill Clinton, and there's sort of you know, a lot of coverage of the militia movement and so on, and, you know, that I think dramatically overstated its influence and reach and power. And you had movies like Arlington Road and so on, where it was, you know, the militia movement was Tim Robbins living next door to you, and he was going to blow up your family and so on. Um, and then and then it dies away. And, or maybe it doesn't die away, but it well, certainly... Well, it did. I mean, it, 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 I think that, you know, everyone who studies this suggested that in the wake of the kind of huge backlash following, um, right. following Waco, the movement... Right, but in the case of, of, of McVeigh, you have a then, period... And you then have a somehow, somehow we had then eight years of the Bush administration in which we had almost no right-wing terrorism... Um, whatsoever. That strikes me as just as, as not coincidental. Right, but I guess what the premise that I'm disputing here is mm -hmm. that we have any evidence that there's a big eruption of actual right-wing terrorism no, there's at, not the, at, the, at, the, at the moment, right? I mean, no, what, what, no, what you're dealing with in the early Clinton years is in some sense some kind of, you know, quasi-organized um, sort of quasi-organized group of affiliates where somebody like Timothy McVeigh actually plots to commit an act of violence against the government of the United States. What you have now are, um, you know, a couple examples of mentally ill people who may have been inspired in some sense by Glenn Beck. You have a clearly mentally ill person in this instance who I would say the evidence of any link to, you know, the Tea Party and so on is at this moment, and again, this could change tomorrow, but it's remarkably thin. Um, and what's, you know, and you have a, I mean, we've been, you know, it's 48 hours now, and all anybody wants to talk about is the fact that Sarah Palin put Wait. a target on a, uh, put a target on a map. I want to back up about, I want to back up a couple of steps, because sure. I, I, dis, I disagree with a couple of things. I mean, first of all, in the Clinton years, there was, like I, as I said before, there was a series of um, smaller scale kind of domestic terrorist attacks preceding um, Oklahoma City. And as far as I know, a lot of them were kind of lone wolf, mentally unhinged people. And we've seen, you know, and that's actually people who study terrorism will say that the right is right-wing terrorists are more likely to be kind of lone wolves, left-wing terrorists um, are more likely to operate in cells for reasons that I'm, you know, not entirely sure about. We have seen already, you know, we, th there was not, for example, this a murder of an abortion clinic doctor for eight years during the Bush administration, but there has been this ramping up of violence. Um, you know, it's really... It's really worth well. There's going been with one. There's been one murder of an of, of an abortion clinic doctor. And right, and a, and and a ramping up that everybody who you know works in clinics talks about a ramping up of, of threats, of harassment, that sort of thing. But I would just urge. I mean, seriously, like Ross, you or anyone who is watching this, there's a really interesting timeline on um, the Coalition Against Gun Violence. Which is ba which has basically just been kind of trapping both incitement and acts of violence um, over the last two years, and it's a pretty stunning document. I mean, I, I would I would be hard pressed to see how somebody could kind of read that and say that there isn't um, a pattern and that there isn't you know something of significance happening here. And the other when you talked about kind of Bill Clinton deftly exploiting this, and the one thing that I found truly offensive in your column was when you said something about the, sh the shooting being a gift to liberals. I really, truly, even as someone who's like pretty cynical and, you know, sees the use of, of using certain disasters for political gain, 
I really do not think that liberals, having been genuinely worried about threats against congressmen, who's, against various congressmen who supported our agenda, um, regard it as a gift that someone that we support was shot in the head. I mean, I really don't. I think the... I, 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 well, I, I mean, except the... Democrat. I mean, you know, again, it was a, it was admittedly an anonymous quote in a political story, in a Politico story, but except for the Democratic operative who immediately said, um, you know, well, they need to they need to tie this to the Tea Party as deftly as possible. But I think that, and, but, and right, except, but I think that I guess we're we're I and except I, for no no just a second okay. and except for the raft of. Uh, bloggers, pundits, and so on, who have said things along the line of, lines of, even if there is absolutely no connection between this murder and any kind of Tea Party anything, this is a really good opportunity to talk. You know, the important thing is that the right is out of control, right? I mean, this is sort of, you know, this is what Michael Tomaski said something like this, George Packer said something like this, and so on. I mean, I, I'm hard-pressed to say... I'm, I'm hard-pressed to say, I'm, when, when I say that it's a gift to liberals, I don't mean that liberals woke up, woke up in the morning and thought it's wonderful that this congresswoman was shot because now we can make hay out of it. That's obviously not the, the thought process that's going through everybody's head. But I, I will say that I've been kind of, kind of amazed by, in a period when, we know, when we've known next to nothing about the motivations of this guy, how many people, and by many people, I mean just about every single um, political writer, with I think the admirable exception of Jonathan Chait for the New Republic, who had a blog post today telling people to dial it back. But just about every political writer has basically taken this as an opportunity to, um, you know, to attack the political right. And I mean, look, it's you know, it's politics. All's fair in politics. And no, but um, I guess but, what I'm disagreeing with you about is that most of the people myself included, who are making this argument are not making it out of a kind of a, a cynical, I mean, a cynical attempt to make political hay, as much as there is, I am convinced that there is a genuine connection between the climate of right-wing hysteria, um, kind of violent militant rhetoric, um, you know, widespread promotion of conspiracy theories, and violence against the federal government and elected officials. Um, and, and I also disagree with you about there being virtually no evidence. I think that it's not a, um, you know, although he, uh, the, I disagree with you about there being virtually no evidence of, um, kind of Lautner having any political motivation, and clearly he was delusional. But, but it wasn't an accident that he chose this congresswoman who's been, you know, kind of demonized by the same sort how, of... How do, you, how do you know that it wasn't an accident? It's okay. That's a good point. Uh, I'll, re I'll rephrase that. I, I mean, look, it it, and, and me again, I, I'm sorry to keep no. reiterating this, but you know, we may, we may, it may not have been an accident. We may, you know, we may, we know, may know more about him in 24 hours. What we know right now is that the only connection so far to him, between him and Giffords, is that in 2007, a friend remembers him going to one of her campaign events and asking one of his sort of opaque, opaque sort of grammar-based questions right. that he thought was very clever, and he thought her response was really, you know, flippant, idiotic, or stupid. And this was in and, 2007, and, and, a period when, again, like, we're just going on fragments here, but his friends were saying things like, you know, well, I mean, his, you know, his politics, as far as I know, seemed pretty left liberal. He sort of talked about his frustrations with the Bush administration. He was really into the 2012 prophecies. Um, and so on. Now, again, like, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's all about, you know, maybe it's just, you know, him, him being, you know, him taking this germ of an idea from 2007 that was then, you know, picked up by Sarah Palin's, by Sarah Palin's map. I'd say the odds that he saw Sarah Palin's map or something like 100 zillion to one, but, you know, maybe, maybe he did and so on. Um, I, but I guess the, the, I, I don't think we have any evidence of that, and no. I think it could. I think it's perfectly likely that you know. I, I mean, I I do not make a study of these psychological types for a living. I do, however, you know, follow many of these cases of people shooting up places and so on, and they seem to operate from a wild array of motives. 
some of them political, some of them quasi-political, some of them not at all political. And again, I just think, you know, at this point, knowing how, I, I just think, given how little we know, I, I guess I'd put it this way. Well, me, if, if, if people are so sure, if people, if, if liberals are so sure that this is the vindication of, you know, all of their warnings about the dangers of the radical right, maybe, you know, why not wait 48 hours? Why not wait 72 hours? What's, what's with the rush to judgment? What's with wait, the certainty? Okay, that, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy argument, because obviously people are going to discuss this thing and speculate and feel very emotional, not vindicated, but feel like, you know, after having kind of constantly said that something like this was going to happen, it's happened, to say, why not wait 48 hours to discuss it if you're so sure strikes me as a pretty bad faith argument. And well, I don't look, think, look, I don't let, think me, let me ask point. you this. If, if I had written a column thing? the day after Nadal Hassan, you know, um, shot, up, shot up Fort Hood, that was like, you know, I've been warning about the radical, you know, the radicalization you know of, of right domestic Muslims for years, and you see, I mean, and and that this just proves that, you know, the crazy. So and, and I'm Wait, saying you I didn't write that column, but about a hundred other people on the right did. Well, you're not talking to those hundred other okay. people on the That's right. That's fair. And uh, and a lot and I mean and a lot of people I mean. Yeah, we'd, we'd have to go back and look at how many, you know, in, in what sense in what sense that developed. But I'm honestly not trying to make a point here about mm -hmm. about the sort of how the right is better than the left. The right is guilty of all kinds of hysterias all the time, mm -hmm. including some of the, his, you know, including many of the hysterias that I think you're right to criticize. I think the question is just whether it's fruitful when, especially in a period when you know so little about the killer's motivations. I mean, I, I guess, I, Wait, and I guess part of the question know, is, right, one like... One of the things that we really disagree with is that, I think, is that you see the kind of evidence of right-wing conspiracy theories in, those, in that video as being incredibly thin. I see it as being much more significant, that the only kind of moments of lucidity in those videos are when he's pointing to theories that he lifted, you know, kind of straight from the militia movements, theories that are very current in Tea Parties and that have been injected into the mainstream via Glenn Beck. Does that mean it's Glenn Beck's fault? No. But I do think that here you have this kind of very unstable, marginal, um, possibly schizophrenic character. These are exactly the kind of characters that are prone to taking little bits of um, conspiracy narratives and, and leaving their own, their own elaborate fantasy worlds out of them, and although everybody kind of gives them the pieces to build those fantasy worlds, not then responsible for what they do, it just, it strikes me as, um, as, as, as pure denial to kind of see any sort of, um, any sort of connection between his fantasy world and the way he acted on it, and the kind of broader political context um, in which he was living. Well, I guess, I, I mean, these, these, these conversations are always so, so, so recursive in a way, but like, you know, if, if you go back to the middle of the Bush years, right, and there's a big debate, you know, this is one of these never-to-be-settled debates where conservatives say, well, you know, maybe some conservatives sound crazy now, but liberals sounded crazy during the Bush years and so on. Um, but, you know, go, go back to the middle of the Bush years. Go back to the period when, you know, Michael Moore's, Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 came out, right? And Michael Moore was feted at the White of Washington premiere that many Democratic politicians attended. And Michael Moore sat with Jimmy Carter, a former president of the United States, in a box, I think, at the Democratic convention. Um, you know, so Michael, Michael Moore is a figure who, you know, there is at least some, some, some connections to the institutional Democratic Party, right? Um, you know, Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 is a film that, you know, makes a lot of valid critiques of the Bush administration, some critiques that I agree with that are mixed in with what are, frankly, conspiracy theories about the reasons that we invaded Afghanistan having to do with, you know, building a pipeline and so on. But to me, the, the, the salient thing is not so much... Um is, is what kind of action Michael Moore was urging. And Michael Moore was never urging, you know, that you, um, you know, was never saying meet Mr. Smith, Mr. Yeah, was never talking about Second Amendment remedies, was never saying meet Mr. Smith 
and Mr. Wesson. I mean, the people who were on the far on the far left of the Bush administration. I mean, usually the furthest they went was that they thought that Bush should be hauled up before the Hague. So if some you know kind of rogue. Um, a freelance um, agent of the International Criminal Court had tried to assault the president, perhaps you could have drawn some kind right. of... Right, yeah, so I it's definitely kind of a, kind of a fun... No, I mean, it, I, I do say it's, it is, I think, a fair point that, that the, you know, in, in a sense, on the, on the radical left, the, the, the end point of the radical left's fantasy world might involve a sort of team of UN paratroopers landing in, landing on and the And the thing West. is that it wasn't always this way. I mean, the radical left did have its own romance with paramilitary violence in the 60s and 70s. And it was a romance that occasionally gave way to genuine acts of terrorism, and you know, far worse actually in, in Europe than here. And then it was discredited, and it kind of completely gave up. You know, it didn't just kind of stop using that that kind of language out of you know decorousness. It really divorced itself from that kind of ideology to the point where now you know kind of you know there's no resonance with say you know a beret and a machine gun. Um, you know, a kind of person in a Che Guevara T-shirt is kind of a joke. That's just that whole frame of looking at political problems and seeing a kind of revolutionary violent solution, it just doesn't exist, um, certainly among liberals, and even really at the fringes of the far left, in the same way that, that those frames are still quite powerful, I think, for much larger swaths of the right. Right. I mean, I guess I guess I would, well, I mean, there, there are a few things going on here, right? So you are, you're, there's there are sort of layers here. There's a layer that's conspiracy theorizing, right? There's a layer that's sort of, um, you know, that's sort of suggesting that that um, the, you know the president is illegitimate. Obviously, this is sort of the birther the birther conceit and so on. There's the, you know, there's there's sort of the layer that's um, that's saying that well, this is you know creeping dictatorship and violations of the constitution and so on. And then there's the layer that's um, you know, just sort of se talks about Second Amendment remedies um, and sort of makes you know sort of hints hints at violence and so on. And I mean, I guess the problem the problem, Michelle, is that like it's very hard to sort of prove this kind. I mean, no, it's it's not hard. It's impossible. You're never going to prove that a certain kind of climate led to a certain kind of action. What I think you can prove. In not in any specific case, but what I think you can prove is that these kind of this kind of violence is more common during certain political moments than others. Well, right, but one possibility too that's worth keeping in mind is that this kind of violence is more common during periods. You know, I mean, the the Obama era has coincided with a period of massive, you know, massive unemployment, economic dislocation, and so forth. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the early Clinton years were likewise. You know, I mean, the early 1990s were nothing like the Great Recession, but they were also, but they were the last period of real sustained economic pain that we lived through. And I think if you look at, I mean, a lot of what's happened in the Republican Party over the last couple of years is the result of, you know, the 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 leader of the Republican Party who understood himself and was understood by many conservatives as a kind of, you know, moderate Republican, squishy, compassionate conservative. And I understand this is not how liberals regarded him, but this is, this is you know, within, within um, sort of the, the realm of conservative thought, this was the role that George W. Bush played. His presidency ended in disaster, failure, massive unpopularity, you know, endless foreign wars, and then a huge economic disaster. This left the Republican Party rudderless, without, you know, without leadership and so on. And there's been a period in which, you know, a lot of the more noisy, extreme voices in the party have sort of filled that vacuum over the past couple of years. Um, and that much, I think, is clearly true. And I think that a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff that Glenn Beck says and that, you know, that, um, that, that, that gets said on talk radio and so on is absolutely worthy, worthy, of, worthy of criticism and condemnation. I want to go back to what you said about this being kind of economic dislocation, because it's obviously true that these kinds of, um, you know, this kind of political violence is connected to economic dislocation. But ideology and kind of movements and conspiracy theories shape how the kind of, you know, shape how 
these kind of grievances are expressed. So for example, you know, the militia movement really came out of the farm crisis of the 80s. And it was because there was organizers who were, you know, there in the Midwest saying that this is because, you know, Jewish bankers are, um, you know, making these loans and char you know, charging you kind of usurious interest rates and, you know, are, 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 are stealing your land. That was the kind of ideology that then led to first the Posse Comitatus, um, which I might be pronouncing wrong, but that movement which essentially said, you know, you're not subject to state laws, you're only subject to kind of sovereign citizens' courts and gave people kind of ideological reasons to refuse to pay their debts and refuse to participate in the legal system. That gave way to the militia movement, um, you know, and to some of the kind of violent right-wing terrorism that we saw in the 90s. It wasn't inevitable that the grievances spurred by first the farm crisis and then later kind of broader, you know, economic um, downturn of the early 90s, it wasn't inevitable that that was going to be directed in a certain way. You know, in other countries, in Europe, it is directed, you know, you can see, you know, there's like, there's riots that are directing it in a quite different way. And so it's not an either or, either it's, you know, ideological and cultural or it's economic. The two things obviously are working symbiotically. Right. That, I mean, but, well, but, but like, again, let's, let's take, you know, the, the case under discussion, right? So this guy, you know, one of, one of the things, again, going on rumor and hearsay, one of the things that people close to him said was that, you know, he thought that 9-11 was an inside job, right? And this is a pretty common view. It sort of comes it's associated with the far left, but it comes from a place where, you know, the far left can bleed into the far right and so on, the world of Alex Jones and so forth. But this is an idea that gains immense currency, and by immense, obviously I'm talking like 15% of the population, but, you know, not, not insignificant during the Bush years. Um, it's something, and, and then, you know, and maybe it's ultimately fertilized and leads to something, you know, some to, to crimes during the economic dislocation brought on by the Obama era. Now, who's, you know, I mean, who's, whose fault is that? Is it the fault of people on the far left who raised this idea in 2005? Or is it the fault of people on the far right who encouraged, uh, you know, sort of climate of violence in, the, in, in 2011? Again, I mean, these are just... Another thing I would want to say, another something... But, but, but no, something listen, 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 Michelle, I'm just, I just want to say, I'm, I'm just sitting here with, you know, I, I have a bunch of right-wing blogs that, um, you know, open right now, and, and they are um, basically going through, I mean, this is where these, where these arguments go, but this is like Michelle Malkin, right, is just sort of has a post that runs for, you know, 500 lines or something that's just examples of um, sort of, you know, quasi-violent images of Sarah Palin, right? Sarah Palin being hanged in effigy in Los Angeles, um, you know, abort Sarah Palin stickers and so on, going going down the list and so on. And then it goes through, you know, this, this that, and the other thing from the Bush era and so on. And, I mean, I, I guess, again, like, you know, the, the kind of, at, at a moment of, you know, horror and tragedy like this one, the fact that this is the argument we're getting into I, I mean, I guess it's also, it's not clear to me, like, what, you know, what, what concessions are, are, are people on the left hoping to wring out of conservatives? I by told you already, I would like a concession, but this is the concession I would like. I would like a, an acknowledgement that, it, that conservatives should not use violent insurrectionary rhetoric about the federal government or liberals. I would like the concession that liberals, that, that it is not okay to wink or hint at um, assassinating government officials um, or kind of preparing for a guerrilla warfare in the event of imminent totalitarian takeover. Is that really too much to ask? I think that that concession is perfectly reasonable. But what I have heard over the past 24 hours is a fixation not on you know, Sharon Angle's, Sharon Angle winking at violence, it's a fixation on Sarah Palin's map, which frankly seemed like a pretty normal piece of sort of, you know, I mean, the, 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 the problem is that the line between sort of violent, it, what? It, well, look, you're, you're right, obviously, that politics is, 
is suffused with with kind of violent or like imagery. Um, right. I, I do think that if Sarah Palin, if Sarah Palin's map, you know, in certain ways, I understand. I get that it's you know unfair and 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 unfortunate, and she probably feels sick about it. Although I also think there's something really ridiculous about her claim now that those actually weren't gun sites, that they were prospecting marks. Right. Um, well, what they what they actually, I mean, the, the thing itself seems to be the thing that, like, if you look at magazine layouts that they put in areas of the page that need, need to be cut out, so it's technically not neither, but, but, but like, that's, no, I, I agree. That's. I mean, they were they were they were targets, and they but they were targets in the same way that the Democratic Campaign Committee put targets over you know Thaddeus McCotter's district with a pop up of Thaddeus McCotter's see, face talking about, about. What about someone like Jesse Kelly, right? Jesse Kelly, who was um, who was Gifford's opponent in the congressional election, posing in camouflage with the machine gun across his lap saying, you know, this I'm, is no rhino. This, I'm no rhino. Right. And then holding target and then holding a target shooting fundraiser saying something like set your sights on November, remove Gabrielle Giffords from office, come shoot an MK sixteen with Jesse Kelly. That strikes me as being again, much closer to much closer to kind of winking at um, at political violence than, you know, than, than Sarah Palin's map. Yeah, I think that that's closer to winking at political violence. Let me, okay, no, let, I don't want to say closer. That strikes, that is winking You think at that that's violence. just winking at political violence yes. rather than, I mean, the, the initial, you know, the initial I'm no rhino image is pretty clearly not winking at political violence, right? It's just saying. Do you not see anything troubling on the right in general just about this entire kind of iconography of, um, I mean, I know that, that guns have long been a signifier of kind of, you know, cultural authenticity for the right, but this... Yeah, I think they, I mean, that's, the, in general, um, I think that guns are a signifier of cultural authenticity for the right. I mean, I think that, like, you know, I mean, what, what's, what's your view of sort of the Joe Manchin ad where he says, I'm going to go to Washington and shoot the cap-and-trade bill, and then he shoots the cap-and-trade bill, right? I mean, is well, that winking at political against, violence? Um, well... Okay, first of all, no, because he wasn't saying I'll shoot at, he wasn't, it, this, no, I, I, I mean, first of all, I don't want to defend that, I think that was abhorrent. I, I think it was a little bit different in that it was targeting um, a piece of a, paper, a piece of paper as opposed to a person with a name. Right, but well, I mean, we can go back right, no, I mean, I, again, yeah, I think that there are like, you know, there are, there, there are lines here, but I guess, I guess I don't think that like, you know, I, I think that it's totally reasonable to object to people explicitly winking at, at attacks on public figures. But I also don't think that, like, American political rhetoric, which is always going to be sort of heated and over the top in a country of 300 million people, should be held hostage by schizophrenics. Like, I, I just, I, and I think that that's sort of, that's at least sort of 50% of the, you know, I mean, I know it's obviously it's absurd and it's not going anywhere, but a congressman introduced a bill banning, you know, banning placing targets on on um, the names of public officials. Or well, so, again, you know. obviously I don't agree with that, and I don't think, again, I should point out, I don't think any of this should be an argument, should be a First Amendment argument, right? I'm not talking about bans or laws, I'm talking about norms and what we consider, you know, okay, and what, you know, whereas there's other things that people say that, that they then have to kind of apologize and they get drummed out of um, mainstream discourse, right? I'm not, so, no, I don't think that there should be a ban. I don't support Right, that no, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting you think that, that there should be a ban. I'm just saying that, like, the this kind of moment can breed a I mean, you know, the, the Clinton, the... the you know, a lot of the things that liberals objected to in the Patriot Act were things that Bill Clinton had asked for um, right, as part of the expansion City. of federal power after after um, uh, Oklahoma City. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that you can have certainly what I think many people on the left would consider to be overreactions after something like this. And again, in a case where the evidence of actual political motivation is so thin, it just seems like the, I, I just think the leap that's being made is awfully large. But, 
I don't know. I mean, there's something, I, I guess, I, I mean, I, like, you know, you go back to the Bush era, right, again, and, like, you know, you have books. You wrote a book about the Christian right in America that had a responsible title called, it was Kingdom Coming, right, The Rise yeah. of the New Christian Nationalism. The Rise of Christian Nationalism. Right. Um, this was, you know, one of a slew of books about evangelical Christians and the, the potential threat that, or that the evangelical fringe, at least, posed to American democracy. Many of the others had titles like American theocracy or American fascists and so on. And, you know, some of the more obscure ones talked about how the Christian right was going to, you know, hand out ID cards to non-Christians and so on. Wait, what book was that? I mean, I'm, I'm Oh, it was one of the ones I had to review for, it was, it was one of the more... Uh, in the in the I did a review for first things of these. Oh, books. I remember it. I've actually always wanted to ask you about that review. Um, we don't need to go into litigating that, but I've, I've actually always been genuinely curious because I know that one of the things you criticized me for in that review was for overstating the importance of um, R. J. Rushdie. Yes. And I've always been curious to know whether you ever read the first things um, obituary about R. J. Rushdie and how important he was. Which um, who was it by? I, I should. I'll, I'll look. I'll look it up. Right, or you can you can send it to me and I'll and I'll read it. And the next time we do blogging heads, um, we can we can talk about R.J. Rushdie <laughs> and and his significance. Um, um, you know, actually, I, I have a feeling we're probably not going to make any more. <laughs> any more? <laughs> any more? Well, I'm just trying to think if there's anything anything else I want to that I I want to press you on, um, because obviously the other thing we were going to talk about abortion, we might not make any progress on either. Um, I mean, I guess it's, I guess, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, I, I guess I just come back, I, I think we'll, we'll know more about this guy in a few days, and we'll have sort of, we'll have sort of a stronger sense of, of, of his motivations, and probably we should have, you know, we should have talked about this then. This is, I'm vi violating my own statement that people should wait, um, wait, wait to pass judgment. So, um, so abortion. Yeah, and your, your column, um. So I should say, I, I wrote a column that was about, um, the, the column before the column that I guess we started talking about here, um, the, was was about um, the well. It started with the MTV special, um, "No Easy Decision," where one of the young women who'd been on their program, 16 and pregnant, got pregnant again, and they decided to um, do a special showing her having an abortion. Um, and then it sort of talked about, it sort of um, sort of ran that in parallel with some of the recent. Um, pieces, one in the Times Magazine, one in New York Magazine, um, that sort of talk about midlife infertility, and I talked about how legal abortion has led to a decline in adoption. Um, so, yeah, I guess that was the overall thrust. And, and then you, I finished up with some pro-life rhetor rhetorical flourishes. Does it make sense to you why, do you understand at any level, you know, why so many women were kind of so outraged by the suggestion or what seemed to be the implicit suggestion that, um, you know, kind of more disadvantaged young people should have children so older white people will have someone to adopt? Um, if that had been my suggestion, then I would, I would understand why okay, people you don't were see outraged. that as being implicit? I mean, so what... Well, I, I think, I mean, and this is, again, why we, why <laughs> the sort of, the difficulty of having these conversations, but so much of the abortion debate turns, right, on whether the, whether... Whether you think that um, that you know in in a pregnancy a sort of a human life that's deserving of some kind of legal respect already exists, and I think that oh, see, I, I, I think I, that I think that it's I, I I frankly think that the argument that um, well yeah so so I think that if if the argument was it would be you know we should it would be great if we lived in a world where lots of poor women. Um, got themselves knocked up and then carried the child to term no, and handed it off. And that's, so I, I'm not accusing you of making that argument um, at all. I do. I don't think that the crux of the argument over abortion actually is whether the fetus um, is is a person or, or a human life. I think that I don't. I don't know that. I mean, not speaking for for all all feminists or all pro choicers. I mean, I don't think that there is any doubt that the fetus is something different than a 
Columbus cells, that it has value. I mean, I, I personally see a continuum between the moment of conception and you know, the baby nine months later. But, but that's not the crux of, of the issue to me. The, I mean, the crux of the issue is the government's power to force someone to carry a pregnancy against their will. Um, you know, pregnancy is a pretty intense physical experience, even at even when everything goes incredibly smoothly. It has physical consequences. Um, you know, the kind of pain you're subjected to in a delivery would be probably classified by torture under the Geneva Conventions if, it was, if you were subjected to it in any other kind of context. And the idea that the government can force this on you is so shocking to me, it's so dehumanizing. The idea that it would be up for a popular vote, whether or not I personally should, should, should have to undergo um, this sort of thing or not, um, especially in a context when the government cannot, say, compel you to give up a kidney, even to even if it even if there is no real kind of cost to your health, and even if it will save the life of somebody who is inarguably a human being. I mean, it's just having you know kind of outside jurisdiction over one's body in this sense is so shocking to me and the if you if you're genuinely I, I can see I, I can certainly understand why people of goodwill find abortion horrifying um, I will never understand why those people do not then demand a demand the kind of reforms that would give us a um, culture more like the one in Western Europe where abortion rates are the lowest in the world. Well, I mean, one point that should be made is that in many Western European countries, um, abortion is more restricted than it is in the United States. Right? right, but not very much more. I mean, certainly not in Holland. It's not. It's certainly well, not in not in. I mean, Holland is obviously the eternal example, but but it also um, but France, France, and France and France and Germany. Right. It's also. I mean. Again, France and Germany are much larger countries that have more restrictive, you know, what I think you would consider probably offensively restrictive regimes where after after the first, I think it's, um, they changed it in France actually, so it's, 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 it's allowed later in pregnancy, but they're sort of, there's much more involvement, um, especially later in pregnancy mm -hmm. from medical institutions and so on and sort of approving abortions. Um, but, but they are, I mean, it is, it, it's, right. you know, it's basically France has the abortion regime that the United States would have largely if we overturned Roe versus Wade, which is to say it's more heavily restricted in the second trimester than it is in the United States, right? And, fr and, and freely available, and, and that's not quite true. Well, I mean, if, right, well, it, then it, regime, right, then it intersects. For, it wouldn't be freely available and paid for by the government in the first trimester. And, you know, those, th those kind of compromises, I mean, part of the reason why people like me consider second trimester abortion so very, very important to protect. I mean, besides the fact that people need it for medical reasons, you know, and I'm, I'm at an age now that it's very, very unlikely that I am ever going to have an elective abortion. Where I take this incredibly personally is that, you know, when I start, you know, I'm married, when I start a family, I do not want, um, your or you know the Republican Congresses mm -hmm. to have a vote in what, how I proceed if there are um, you know kind of tragic and terrible abnormalities in a wanted pregnancy um, at the end of the second or in the third trimester. But going back to the second trimester, I mean the reason that there are too many second trimester abortions in this country is because it is so very difficult for so many people to get a first trimester abortion. Um, you know, but there is certainly no common ground about expanding the access to very early abortions in order to make later abortions um, less likely. And you know, which, from a, in certain ways, I understand why the anti-abortion movement is not willing to go there. What I do not understand, and, and will never understand, is why they're not willing to make what seems to me the even more elementary step of encouraging 
contraception, you know, and especially when we have, you know, kind of enough evidence compared to, you know, internationally about the relationships between, you know, regimes of widespread contraceptive, both like availability and acceptability, because it's not just that you can get it more easily in Europe, it's just that it's much more of a norm to use it, and very, very low abortion rates. Well, but the, the data from the, from the United States, the state-by-state state data, doesn't match up with the U.S. to Europe comparisons. I mean, if you look at abortion rates by state, um, overall, it's the states where I think you would, it's the states that you would argue have the better policies on contraception and sex education that tend to have the higher abortion rates overall. Now, there are a lot of sort of cross-cutting factors there, but I mean, you know, if you're looking within the U.S., if you're looking at states with low abortion rates, you're looking at the Upper Plains states and the Deep South, and if you're looking at states with higher abortion rates, again, in general, you're looking at sort of the more urbanized northeastern and western states. And some of that, again, is like urbanization and so on. But some of, um, And some of it, and honestly, this is not a figure that I know, and I and I'm, somebody probably has it, Gutmark or someone probably has it, but it would, some of it is people traveling, you know. There some are, of it is. Gutmarker has data on, like, the number of people, you know, who are from Nebraska getting abortions in Kansas and so on, and I'm not, I, I don't, yeah, I don't remember it exactly. I, I, I'd actually like to go back to the sort okay. of big picture philosophical <laughs> question, yeah. if we could, for a second, because, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess what, what, what I wonder about is to what extent, I mean, you, you say, you know, you think life is a continuum and so on, and, you know, you sort of, you, I mean, what, but clearly there is, well, not clearly, but I would assume there is some, um, you know, some balance that that you would I mean your your support for legal abortion probably has something to do with your views on um, sort of fetal and embryonic development right or does it do you, does it really have I would say this I mean yes however even if you could let's say you could convince me that a that an eight week old fetus is a <clears throat> Is, is a human being in the kind of, you know, entitled to all rights and privileges of, of a human being. Right. I'm still, I still think it would be a huge leap to then say that that human being has a right to um, reside in my uterus. That that human, that, that, that I am required to right. undergo, okay. that I'm required to undergo, you know, kind of <clears throat> medical risk that I'm inquired. So, I, okay, let me put it a different way. If you could make, if you could convince me, which you're not going to in the next 10 minutes. No, no, I know. That, that an eight-week-old fetus is a full human being, you then you could convince me of um, maybe to change my moral stance on abortion. You... That still would not be would not change your view on the legality, on, right? On the on there is just there is no and and it ama I mean it, again it it always amazes me. I don't understand how someone can on the one hand hold that the government doesn't have the right to say impose a, a sixty percent tax bracket, but on the other hand has the right to essentially seize control over. Um, you know, over your physical self. There's there, there's no intrude, there's no one, I can't think of any other kind of analogous situation that requires this level of intrusion and, and dehumanization. Um, but you can, but you can, I mean, you, you say that, but you can probably see why people on the pro-life side don't see that as, as a contradiction. I mean, they would no, say that the government exists to, they would say that, you know, that, I mean, the, the initial purpose of the government is, is to protect um, life and liberty, and there is another human life involved where abortion that, is involved. So the government then, has rights there that don't exist necessarily when you're talking about sort of some other public, you know, that sort of the government has primary and secondary obligations, and the obligation to protect the rights of human beings is primary. No, but if you believe that, then why don't you then believe that people have, um, that, that the government should be able to compel you to give blood when a blood transfusion is necessary, or that, again, that the government should be able to take one of your kidneys. Well, and this is where it comes down it. to the, and this I is mean, where the debate, I mean, it, it, this is where the debate does come down to the fact that in the case of abortion, that life is coming to existence through, through the pregnant woman's own actions. And this is why I think the arguments, uh, the argument for legal abortion is, 
I mean, more compelling to a lot of people, I think, people who are sort of on the fence will say, well, I can, you know, I can totally see in the cases of rape and incest, right, because there you are talking about a case where, right, it's the, fam the famous analogy of, you know, you have an ailing violinist, you wake up and an ailing violinist has been attached to you, and, you know, you have to, you, you have to, uh, you know, stay attached to him for nine months or he'll die. Are you obligated to stay attached to him? Are you? Um, I think that that's, I, th I think that that's one of those... Only if you invited him in the house? I think that, well, let me put it this way. Let's suppose you, you know, there was a button that you could press that would bring into existence a human being with the proviso that you have a choice then between killing that human being and, you know, I mean, if pregnancy was not through sex, but it was through, it was through pushing a button, right? I mean, you know, and then you push that button. I mean, at, at a certain point, don't you think that there is, I mean, obviously, like, you know, it's, I mean, the burden of pregnancy is a burden that, you know, no man will ever, have, will, will ever face, and it's, it's, it's something that, you know, is sort of, in a sense, unimaginable from a male perspective, but don't you think, in a way, there's also something a little bit condescending to women to say that, you know, you're the 50% of humanity that has the ability to have sex and have a new human life come into being inside you, and um, we're not going to, you know, we're going to act as if, you know, you can't, you know, th that this just sort of magically happened. I mean, right, like, you know, I mean, no, the I mean, sexu sexual that, act is a freely chosen saying, act, right? What I'm right? saying is that the sexual, of course, the sexual act is, is in, in, most, in the cases in, that right, we're in talking mo in about. Most, in most we're cases, talking yes. about cases where the sexual act is a freely chosen act. Right. I do not think that choosing the sexual act then requires, then it, it is enough to then kind of allow the government to force you to undergo serious physical um, and, and emotional hardship that is in some cases <clears throat> life-threatening and is in all cases excruciatingly painful. Um, the, 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 the degree of, of dehumanization that, you know, basically undergoing, like, you know, freely consenting to the sexual act then basically allows this, um, you know, when you, when you consent to the sexual act, you then kind of potentially forfeit all control over your physical person. Um, it, right. It's so shocking. It, it but really why, is. But why it's is that so, shocking, Even right? as somebody who's never, you know, I, like I said, the, it's, it's dehumanizing you know that you that your body essentially that by consenting to the sexual act your body becomes public property. Um, there it, it. Well, I mean, it's you know, I mean that's that's one way of phrasing it. Another way to phrase it is that by consenting to the sexual act, you consent to potentially being, you know, a helpless human being steward, right? I mean. You know, we can we can play language games with this, like we're sorry, not language game, but we can, you know, I mean, rhetorical framing matters. But like, but this, I think the where we're saying being a helpless human being steward, that seems to vastly understate the um, again the, toll, the physical right the physical, the physical toll, toll of pregnancy, of pregnancy. and the, you know, and again, like I'm not a radical libertarian. But even as not a radical libertarian, the idea that, that the state can impose those kind of burdens on a person, a person. And, right. but, and, then, and then again, there's, there's another question here. In order to protect another person from being directly killed, right. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that, that is, that's the essence of the pro-life position. That, the, that, that. And, what I mean, and the thing is, is, though, is that I often see that the pro-life position, it, it doesn't, there doesn't even seem to be... Um, a recognition or an acknowledgement, and maybe maybe this is because they don't see it, or maybe this is rhetorical, of the immense burden that they are demanding women shoulder against their will. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, right, I, I think to some extent, like, I think that that can be a fair critique of sort of the institutional Republican Party, that, um, that you know, there is a, there is sort of an unwillingness to recognize sometimes that an actual pro-life legal regime would require sort of I mean, it, it, you know, it's something that doesn't really exist in any developed country and would require a kind, probably a kind of, a kind of, you know, welfare state expansion that a lot of conservatives would be uncomfortable with, right? And, and it would, not just a welfare state expansion. The other thing that it would require um, is a expansion of the surveillance state. I mean, I think that you, 
I, if I remember reading something on your blog, I don't think that you saw a lot of analogies between the famous um, Romanian film about unsafe abortion and the current United States. But the fact is, there are a lot of countries in the world right now where abortion is um, is either substantially or totally illegal. Um, in some of them, like Ireland, to a lesser extent Poland, people just go to other countries. Or in Poland, there are still a lot of doctors who are you know, who, who will work illegally but, but safely. Um, you know, in other countries, like El Salvador, you have such a thing as a forensic vagina inspector who will kind of, you know, subject you to a gynecological examination to find out whether or not your miscarriage was artificially induced. Um, you know, these kind of things exist. When you talk about making abortion illegal, you are talking about making a certain number of them um, clandestine, and under the table, and you're talking right. about punishing women who, ine who, who inevitably have abortions. Um, right, but I think I think what a lot of pro-lifers would say, and I do want to also say as a caveat to my point about the institutional Republican Party, I think that if you look at sort of, you know, at, at the grassroots level and look at what sort of, you know, individual Catholic and evangelical parishes and so on do in terms of support for women who want to carry their pregnancies to term, there are, there is a lot of sort of pro-life work that is, that is done to provide support to pregnant women. Now, obviously, you know, I'm sure you don't like the, you know, the sort of ideological inflection of a lot well, of no, that work, but it does, but it does exist, and money, you know, money is raised at my Catholic parish that is given, you know, given to women who are, who are going, who are, you know, who are going my, through with pregnancies. My problem with that is less the kind of ideological inflection. I mean, I think that if you are anti-abortion, that strikes me as the most kind of honorable way to express it. I've seen a lot of reporting about how quickly that um, support seems to disappear. Um, Early, early in the baby's life, you know, there's there do seem to be a lot of women left um, flailing and alone with, you know, after the baby's born and after the kind of ideological issue is no longer uppermost. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm and I have no doubt that that that, that exists. I, I would I would say though the the other the other point I made that I think to a lot of pro-lifers the arguments that you know that that you make about the burden that's placed on pregnant women and so on and the sort of and the particularities of pregnancy are arguments for you know they're the reason why if you go to pro-lifers and say well what you think you know women should be given 20 years to life for having abortion they'd say of course not not at all you know i don't support putting women in jail and so on precisely because this is such it's you know it's pro-lifers think it's killing but they recognize that it is a distinctive it's a distinctive set of circumstances that doesn't obtain in any other situation. But those are arguments for, you know, they may be arguments for not having vagina inspectors. They aren't arguments for not extending the protection of the law in some form to, um, to the unborn. But, you know, and, but, but I mean, again, you know, this does, in this sense, there is a sense, right, in which, in which you know, I mean, the, the pro-life side is making a kind, it's, it's arguing that you can't, there aren't rights, basically, this is at least in the argument of, in rights-based arguments, pro-lifers would say there aren't really rights that trump the right to life. The right to autonomy, you know, may be real, but it can't be, a, it can't be, a, it can't be a legal trump. And what's astonishing to me is how, but, but that's not an, but that's, that's an argument that's kind of applied very specifically in the case of pregnant women. It's not applied in the case of your um, hypothetical violinist, um, or even more so. It's well, not the applied. hypothetical violinist doesn't exist in the it's case fun, of the transfusion. But, it's, but, it's, but trans it's not applied in the case of, like I said, things like blood transfusions and kidney transplants. I mean, the only people that we are willing that that or that that some people are willing to impose kind of you know profound physical penalties on in, in the name of the right to life are. Um, pregnant women who have, you know, apparently kind of consented to these penalties by the mere act of having sex. Yes, I think that that, I think that that's, that that's fair to say. I think that, I think that there's a, you know, the, the, I mean, pregnant women by virtue of having the life contained inside them are in a, are in a distinctive position that people who, you know, might be able to give blood to save somebody's life aren't in. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not sure we're going to get. It. No, I don't think so. But we've been maybe a little bit more civil on this on this than we were on <laughs> on the. Uh, on the, on the oh, really? Shooting. I thought that was pretty civil. You thought that was pretty civil. Well, you, you've debated that, and I'll have I'll, 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 I'm talking yes, it. Yes, so. neither of us <laughs> charged angrily away from the computer, or, or if you did, I couldn't see you. You could, well, I, you know, I ran away and bashed my head into the wall for a while, but then I came back. So, anyway, um, Michelle, it was a pleasure talking to you, and, and hopefully we can, was, we can do it again at some point when maybe we know even more about the motives of, of the Arizona shooter. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, and, and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.